All right. Wow, it's so good to see all of you. This is exciting. You know, I don't get to do this all that often and meet people in real life. Usually there's a screen between me and you, and tonight there's not, and that means a lot to me to actually see your faces and give you hugs and shake your hands and hear your stories. You know, the goal with everything that I've ever done through the media world is to create content that hopefully brings value to the world and inspires you, the viewers, to do something you never thought possible and to challenge yourself and to do something a little crazy and eat more bean burritos than you ever thought possible. <laughs> Who here eats more beans now after watching my videos? Yay! <laughs> woo -woo. I would really love a bean sponsor. If anybody knows of connections at Rosarita or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, any of them. Any of them. But not Goya. <laughs> anyway. Um, so I want this to be fun and casual. I will definitely speak for a bit, but I want you to feel comfortable to ask questions and we can just have a little bit of a round table. We can pretend that there's a, a campfire here and we're all sitting around the campfire just having fun and, and telling stories. And that's really, that's really the goal. And I'm seeing some people who have been here before, which is exciting. If you've been here before, raise your hand. That's a lot of you. Yeah, what's up? Front row. So my name is Ryan Van Duzer, if you didn't know. Is anybody, does anybody not know me? There's always a couple people that just randomly come to this event. Okay, there we go. Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming and taking a chance on me. Hope you have a good time. At least you get free food. And so I thought I would today talk about something that's a little bit different than what I usually talk about. I usually talk about my big accomplishments and my triumphs. And as you know, this summer, I did something really big, I tried something really big, and it did not go the way I had hoped it would go. And that is not necessarily a bad thing, but it was really hard for me. Like, it really hit me hard. And so I thought it'd be interesting to come here tonight and talk about failure, if you want to call it that, or just when things don't go your way, and how you learn from those experiences, and how I've learned from those experiences, and um, the, you know, how it helps me in the future after having gone through a hard time. And we can all relate to hard times, whether it's on adventures or life or relationships or whatever. We've, that is part of the human experience is to go through tough stuff, right? And so we're all gonna cry tonight. <laughs> no, probably just me. As you know, I'm a softie. <laughs> well, you know, when life gives you lemons, squeeze them into the wounds of your adversaries. <laughs> I don't know if everybody heard that, but he said, when life gives you lemons, squeeze them into the wounds of your adversaries <laughs> or your saddle sores. <laughs> Ooh, ouch, yeah. So I've always been a big dreamer throughout my entire life. I've had big, crazy, wild dreams from a very young age. And with big dreams can come big accomplishments, but also big disappointment. And that was what I call the burden of dreams. And we all have dreams, we all have hopes and desires. And um, so I'm gonna just talk about a few of the different things throughout my life and, and how it shaped me as a person. One of the toughest, well I should, I'll start with this. My career on YouTube is a direct result of things not going my way in the world of TV. A lot of you all know that my initial dreams in the media world was to be a TV host, like an adventure travel guy on Travel Channel or Discover Channel. And I navigated through the TV world for many years, about 10 years, and I would go to casting calls in New York City and LA, and I would get all my hopes up, and I would you know, get on an airplane and spend my own hard-earned money that I really didn't have a lot of at the time, and fly to New York and go to these casting calls and they're very intimidating because there's, you know, you walk into this room and they have a camera and then you sit down and they're like, okay, tell us why you'd be the guy for this job. Or they tell you to read some lines off of a script. And uh, I, I played that game for a long time. I really truly wanted to be a TV host. And the reason why is because I wanted to tell stories. I've always been a storyteller. And I thought the coolest way to do that would be to tell stories through TV, like travel TV shows. Uh, did anybody watch Globe Trekker on PBS? These nerdy travel shows back in the day. But I loved them, and I wanted to be just like that, because I wanted a way to travel for free, essentially. And I thought, well, the only way to do that is to be a TV host. And at the time I started on this journey, there really wasn't any, there was no online video. There was no YouTube. So the only way to do this was to 
get a job in TV. And um, it was hard, you know, and I had some success and every now and then I would, you know, get a job and it might lead somewhere and it might not lead somewhere and there were many times where I got the job and I got so excited and we would go shoot a pilot for the TV show and I thought, okay, finally all the stars have aligned and I'm gonna be a TV host and then for reasons out of my control, everything comes crashing down and you know, I don't, the show does not become anything, it does not see the light of day and I'm bummed out again. And so long story short, what I'm doing now is a, is a result of many, many failures along the way, navigating the TV and the entertainment world to the point where after 10 years, I thought I had finally got the job. It was with Travel Channel. We were down in Mexico shooting a pilot for a new show called How the World Works. And the show was gonna be kind of like Dirty Jobs where I was gonna travel the world and show people how the world works and do different interesting jobs all over the planet. And everybody was like, this is it, this is so great, this is the best pilot we've ever filmed. Finally, after 10 years of struggling and not really making any money and living in mom's basement, because I didn't make much money, this was it, finally. And again, it all came crashing down. Travel Channel got bought by a different parent company and they killed everything that was in production because they wanted to start over new. And I was so bummed out. And at this point, I was like, 35 years old and a lot of my friends or most of my friends had real jobs they were making real salaries and were buying houses and here I was still not really making much money but I had this dream that I was like fiercely following and I didn't know what to do and so it was that point that was the last straw no more TV I can't rely on the entertainment industry and I said you know what I'm gonna try to build up a YouTube channel to the point where I can make a living because at this point, YouTube had become a thing. This was like 2015. A lot of you might remember Casey Neistat. He's a famous New York guy. He was doing these daily vlogs, and I thought it was really interesting, and he did such a great job with those things, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe I can do something like this. But it was going to be more focused than just like general daily vlogs. Like I really wanted to create content that highlighted outdoor adventures and showed people how attainable it is to just do anything really running or biking or hiking you don't have to have you know the best equipment equipment you don't have to be an elite athlete you can just get outside because it's going to make you feel better it's going to make you feel more connected to the world and to nature and to yourself so in 2016 i started the youtube channel that you all know today and i started making one video a week and i had very very slow growth until about the pandemic. So for the first four years of my YouTube journey, I didn't really make much money. I remember finally when my channel got monetized, my first check from YouTube that you get from you know, the, the ads that play, I got like $17. And I was like, yeah! <laughs> at the time, that was at least two Chipotle burritos. You yeah, I gave it to my mom for rent. She's like, finally, you deadbeat. <clears throat> Made $17. But I stuck with it. I was relentless. I knew that someday the money would come and I would be able to move out of mom's basement or make enough money to live. And I created this content that I truly believed in. And it's the same content that you see today. But back then, nobody was really watching it because it's, it's hard to build up a channel out of nowhere. And <clears throat> I got to the point where finally during the pandemic, there was a worldwide sales, worldwide bike sales boom all over the planet. People are buying bikes. And so because of that, people are also looking for inspiration online of what to do with their new bikes. And they found my channel and that's really when my channel took off. And so long story short, what I do now is the direct result of countless failures in my career and a, and a major monumental shift where every day I woke up for those first 10 years, I was like, TV host, TV host. This is all I want to do. I was born to be a TV host. I'm going to do this. And then finally having to accept that that was not going to be my career. And I'm going to try this YouTube thing and see if it works. I didn't know if it was going to work. I still don't know if it's going to work. It's doing a lot better than it was, but it's like one of those things where when you're a creator, a creative person, an entrepreneur, it's always up and down. So just wanted to give that backstory to tell you of where I am today and how those failures led to here. 
And it was really hard, you know, when I get my hopes up for one of those jobs and it didn't happen because I'm like, oh man, I'm a loser. Maybe I'm not, you know, the look. Maybe I'm annoying on camera. Maybe there's too many Olays. Like, I don't know. <laughs> But I wanted to be me, and I've always been me, and I wear my heart on my sleeve, as you all know. And I was just fiercely dedicated to telling the stories that I truly believed in. So that's where I am now, YouTube guy. Those failures led, to me, led me to here. Um, as far as specific adventure failures, you've probably seen a lot of them. Because <laughs> I tell all the stories. You know, I don't sell perfect. That's not the point of my channel. I don't sell perfect bikepacking adventures. I want to show people that when you go on an adventure, inherently the definition of adventure is you never know what is going to happen. You can get pretty prepared, you can have the right gear, but you, you don't know what's going to happen out there. You can get injured, weather can, you know, mess things up, mud, snow, rain. But yeah, I guess I, the first one I want to focus on is uh, the, the most recent one, and we can work back from there. So the Tour Divide this summer was a dream that I had had for well over a year. As you all know, in 2020, I rode the route in, with John and Mira, just as for fun, there, the pandemic was happening, and um, there was nothing else to do, really. And I was like, well, the best way to socially distance is just to be in the middle of nowhere. So. <laughs> I thought that would be a great thing to do. And that was the trip of a lifetime. It was such an amazing summer. We were like Huck, Finn, and Tom Sawyer with Mira. You know, we were just riding our bikes every day, having the time of our lives. And so after that, I started thinking, maybe it'd be interesting to try to really push myself a little further and see what it would be like to race this route. A lot of you know that I race running. Running is like my, really my first love in the outdoor adventure world. But I'd never really bike raced all that much. So that's when the dream was planted, right after I had toured the Great Divide. And I thought, okay, I'm going to race this someday, but I want to get prepared. And this summer, after many months of getting all the gear together, you know, I was on my new Priority ADX that we had specifically designed for the Great Divide in 2020, which was the 600X at the time. And I knew that I wasn't going to go bonkers in the race and like try to be anywhere near the top of the, you know, the list of the top 10 or 20 or 30 even. I just wanted to push myself. I wanted to see how far I could go. Flew up to Banff and I knew immediately that the energy was not quite the energy that I typically enjoy. Like when I go do a bike adventure, I'm not usually super stressed out. But for some reason, and now I know, this race really stressed me out a lot. And it was all the people that were there, and it was like all the attention, and I had announced it on my YouTube channel, and I was like, okay, people are watching this, and I have to perform for them, I thought, and for myself. And Banff is a beautiful town, it's a beautiful city, I'm sure some of you have been there. And the morning of, I just remember being almost like a nervous wreck. Like, I'd I've never had a, a panic attack, but I almost felt like I was having one because I was like, oh my God, this is like, I'm just, all I'm doing is going on a bike trip. Why is this freaking me out? And I'm just going to go a little bit faster than I usually do. Why is this like, you know, making me go a little crazy? And I rode to the start line and everybody's there and everybody's talking and it's fun and exciting. And, and then we were off and it was like, oh, wow, here we go. And at first, it, like, all the stress just melted away from me. I was like, okay, I'm on my bike. I know how to do this. All I have to do is pedal. And I say that all the time. All I have to do today is get on my bike and pedal. And that's something we can all relate to if you love biking or running. As you know, the weather was not very good the first week of the adventure. It was snowy and rainy and very cold. And if there are anything, if there's anything I don't love in the adventure world, it's being cold. You hear me whining about it all the time in my videos. <laughs> but I was prepared. I had warm stuff. But uh, because of all that cold, and I don't need to go through it all because you've watched the videos, I developed severe saddle sores to the point where it was like absolute agony to sit on my bike. And really, when, if you can't be comfortable on your bike, then it's r almost impossible to ride it. And I thought in the moment, like, this is supposed to be somewhat fun. I knew it was going to be hard. I pushed myself in races before, but this is supposed to be more fun than hard. But it got to the point where it was way more hard than fun and just 
downright dangerous. You know, I started telling my mom back home what was happening and other friends and people were like, saddle sores can be dangerous. They can get infected and they can spell serious trouble. And so finally on day six, I had ridden 100 miles. My goal was to ride 100 miles a day, which I was doing, I was on pace. And I woke up in absolute agony and I was so sad because I knew that I was going to quit. I knew that it was over. And it was really hard for me to accept in that moment that my dream was over and I had failed. And I had failed miserably in a way because I was not even close to the finish line. I was in Helena, Montana. And I remember telling my friend who I was riding with, if you watch the videos, this wonderful guy named Gabriel from Montreal, this, this coolest French Canadian in the world. And I told him, and this is not in the video because it wasn't filmed, it's a little awkward sometimes to just hold out a camera when you're crying with somebody. But I told him I was done. And uh, I started crying and then he started crying. You know, we had spent three days together really bonding and he and I were like, we're going to do this together. We're going to finish. We're going to get to that fence in Antelope Wells. And we just stood together off the side of the road in some random patch of grass in Helena, Montana, just crying. And, and, you know, and I didn't really know him all that well. I'd met him. I'd known him for three days, but we had developed quite a bond. And I, I said, you go get to that fence. You get to that fence for me, man. And, um, as you all know, he did. He got to that fence and he, you know, and he kept me in touch the whole way. He would send me messages, which was also good and bad. I didn't really want to like hear about it. <laughs> you know, he's like, hey, Ryan, I'm in, you know, Colorado now, your home state. And I was like, I'm so proud of you, but also shut up. <laughs> and I went, uh, I went home early. And I remember sitting in the Helena airport. My bike was all packed up. And uh, one of the first phone calls I got from the outside world, because I had posted about it, was from Dave here at Priority. And he just called and said, I love you. I love you, ma'am. He's like, it's OK. It's OK. And in that moment, I, was, I felt like, it's, all, it, it's true. It is OK. And I'm sorry if I'm getting emotional again, but it's like, these are the moments in life that really matter, like the moments when like, one of your dear friends calls you and tells you that it's going to be okay. And then you realize, like, this race is not that important. It it's really isn't. In the grand scheme of life, it's not that important. And for Dave to call me and say, man, it's okay. We got you. We support you. We love you. You did your best. And it really meant the world to me. And it kind of changed my perspective on what had just happened. Because I was so sad and I was so just like self-centered about the whole experience. Like oh, I had failed and, you know, I can't believe I didn't do it. And, I, you know, I wanted to ride and have this triumphant experience all the way to the fence and help promote the bike that I had just released. And now none of that is going to happen and I suck, you know. And then Dave turned that all around. So thank you, Dave. I appreciate it. I love you, brother. And that, that's the kind of people you want to work with in life, you know. People that truly care about you. Like, I don't think of priority as being a sponsor because they're not really. Because if I was a truly professional athlete and sponsored by a bike company and I wasn't getting results, that would be a problem. But with Dave and priority and Connor and the team, that's not what it's about. It's about the personal stories. It's about inspiring you to get off the couch and to get out there in whatever way, shape, or form that is. And so... You may have watched the video I called, I titled it, you know, um, Lessons on Failure. And it was all about, like, pretty much what I've talked about. And I went home and I was super bummed out. And it took me a long time to get over the darkness of what had happened. Because it had been a long time since I'd had, a, like, a pretty catastrophic failure and something to not go my way. And I, for a while, I, you know, beat myself up about it, but I was like, you know what? Something better is going to come because of this. And I've always had that perspective throughout my other challenges through life. Is like, there's a reason sometimes. The life works in mysterious ways. And I just, I just believed deep down, like, this is okay. Like, something better will happen. So it, it was interesting to hold, like, two 
conflicting emotions at the same time where one is both extreme sadness and disappointment, but also like hope for the future. But you have to have hope for the future. You have to, because that's what keeps us going as humans, right? Like we've all like had relationships fail or work or getting fired or whatever it is and you think everything is over and it's going to collapse and it's all done. But that's not the case and it's because we have hope. It's because we wake up and we stay focused on what's important. And for me in my life and what's always been the most important is like my family and my friends and my community. And so I really leaned on all of these people this summer during that time. And you want, you want to know what really was my medicine to come out of the great divide? Sadness was going to Ragbri. Absolutely. Ragbri was my medicine. Because all of a sudden I was at a, an event where everybody is so excited and so happy and so supportive. And it's all about having fun. Nobody is racing. And I just got to see humanity. Like... Day after day after day, the best of humanity. I always tell people that Ragbri shows off the best of small town America and the charming small cities and they all come out and the little old ladies are having a spaghetti dinner in the church of the basement and the kids are selling brownies to raise money for their soccer team and that's what matters, that's what's important. You know, just everyday life, family, friends, community and love. So Ragbri was really, really good for me. And we have one of our team members right here. Linda, how you doing? <laughs> She, she came all the way from Pennsylvania tonight with her daughter, so thank you. Do we have any other Team Doozerites out here that were at Ragbri? Oh, yeah. I forgot to uh, introduce uh, the Viking. He's the, the, the newest character on the Team, uh, team Doozer on the channel. He's back there. We did the New Mexico trip together. Anybody watch that New Mexico trip? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as you all know, he is absolutely just so much fun. And, he, it, you know, I, I foresee many, many more adventures with this guy going forward. Yeah. Another thing that happened this summer that I did not expect because I came home early. And nobody knows this, so don't tell anybody. Don't record anymore. Just kidding. <laughs> is it gave me the opportunity to pursue a relationship with somebody that I would not have otherwise been able to do, which is really quite incredible. And it goes again back to what's most important in life. And so I spent time with a very wonderful person this summer, and uh, it's been the most amazing feeling I've ever had in my life. It truly is. And I know you've heard that on my channel before. <laughs> Once or twice. <laughs> but I promise this time it's real. <laughs> yeah. Someday I will introduce her properly, but uh, she's absolutely wonderful. And because I came home early, I had the time to spend with her. Because I would not have seen her for the entire summer if I had done the race, because then she would be traveling and then I wouldn't, we, you know, the things wouldn't have matched up and I wouldn't have had any time with her. So, you know, it all works out the way it's supposed to work out. Absolutely. And, uh, it feels good. Like it feels so good right now to like be full of love and hope and excitement and you know to be dreaming about future adventures again and just spending more time with people whom I love. And Ragbri really is one of those things that reminded me of that because not only was it Ragbri, which is 20,000 people riding across the state of Iowa, but we've created quite a community with the Team Doozerites. We had 250 people on Team Doozer this year at Ragbri. We were the largest team at Ragbri. Wearing hot pink, <laughs> of course. And I want to just give a shout out to Connor and the entire team, Will, for putting all of that together. They, I pitched them this idea of doing Ragbri two, like many years ago, but last year was the first year, this is the second year. And they put so much love and work into creating this team that would be a welcoming spot for anybody who wanted to be part of it. And we had cool shirts and uh, we had bean burrito parties. On the last night of Ragbri, we ordered 300 be bean burritos from the local Taco Bell. Totally, <laughs> totally stressed them out. And the reason why I wanted to do that was because 
Usually at Rag Ride, everybody goes to camp and then everybody scatters and goes to their favorite food cart or whatever. And I was like, it's our last night. Like, let's keep everybody together. I was like, Connor, can we order just a ton of bean burritos for everybody? He's like, oh yeah, I got you. So we, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so Rag Ride really became like an adult, adult summer camp for all of us. And every day we got to know each other better and better and better. And people were creating their own friendships and riding together, and it was really special. It re re really was. Um, I can talk about a few more failures in my life and specific examples, or we can open it up. I don't want to talk at you this whole time, so I think it'd be fun to answer some questions. Here we go, my man. Just curious, uh, were any of the participants in the race supported by some sort of team? In other words, cleaning their clothes, uh, uh, making okay. sure they fed properly? Were any of the people doing the Tour Divide supported by a team, and the answer is no. So it is very, very specifically a self-supported race. And that is actually one of the other things that really was hard for me, because it is so self-supported to the point where you're not even really supposed to accept trail magic from people. Yeah, it's very strict. And the guy who dreamed up the Tour Divide was like, I want people who have, they're all on the same page, so if you're like a local hometown hero and you run into like through Montana and people are hooking you up, like that's not fair because there might be a guy from Lithuania who doesn't know anybody and he's not getting the same attention and the same handouts from people. So it is very, very um, strict in that, in that regard. And that was hard for me because my favorite thing in the whole wide world is trail magic and meeting people and accepting bean burritos from random strangers on the street <laughs> that hopefully were clean, made with clean hands. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that, was, that was tough. And actually, I made a video before I did the Tour Divide explaining like, the rules and what was going to happen. And I was like, you know what, but I'm not really taking this race all that seriously. I'm not going to be a contender. So if you want to come and meet me and bring me a bean burrito, like, do it. And I got so much backlash because of that. There were so many comments saying, Ryan, I can't believe you're blatantly going to cheat and what's the point of doing this race if you're not going to follow the rules? And it Bean burritos are never cheating. Thank you. <laughs> Bean burritos are never cheating. That is right. That's why you found out racing is not for you. And that's how I found out racing, especially in that format, right. is definitely not for me. Because my whole mission when I go on bike rides is to meet people and connect. And as you saw in the videos, people were still coming out. <laughs> people were still like, coming to meet me, and it was wonderful. And those were the best moments of the entire experience. But technically, they really shouldn't have been doing that. And I shouldn't have been egging it on and accepting their <laughs> gifts. <laughs> yeah. In the, in the video, our solos are stuck in my mind. You're riding along, uh, along the slope, and you're saying, don't fall, don't fall, don't fall. Yes. How scary is that? The, when I'm riding along, riding along the edge and hoping not to fall, I mean, it's not like... It's not not scary. I mean, the danger is there. If for some reason I had fallen, I would have fallen down a cliff. But I'm pretty comfortable on my bike. I knew that I wasn't, unless like a rock came down from the mountain and knocked me off my bike, which would be totally random. Uh, it wasn't really that much of a threat. Okay. Nobody's died on the, that section of the Tour Divide. Yeah. Let's just say. Because that's the thing in, in my mind. But could I do this? Yeah, you could definitely do it. You could definitely do it. That's, and, and I, I'm not saying that just because I don't even know you, but it's like you can definitely do the Tour Divide. That route is really not, by any means, the hardest bike route I've ever done. It's mostly dirt roads, gravel roads, and I think if you're comfortable on a bike and you're fairly strong, you can pull it off. I mean, there's some sections that are rough and tumble, but you can walk them. So. What's, the hardest, what's the hardest thing you've done? The hardest thing I've ever done in my life um, <laughs> hardest thing I've ever done in my life, uh, cycling, um, oh, the Colorado Trail by far. The Colorado Trail by far. The Colorado Trail is extremely difficult. That is a hiking trail. It's made for walking. There are rocks everywhere. <laughs> and so, and the altitude is above 10,000 feet the entire time and Max is out at 13,000 feet and the storms up high are crazy and wild. And, you know, as you, like, if you've seen the videos, I'm like, whole, like dragging my bike up mountains in many cases. Very difficult. Jabba has hiked it twice. Three times. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Three times. 
Um, that's, that's a tough one. Very, very tough. Hard. The Great Divide is nothing like that. You can pedal every bit of the Great Divide route. Was that harder than Baja? I would say the Colorado Trail was harder than Baja, yeah. Um, now that I've done them both. In the moment, Baja was the hardest. And Baja was the, my very first bike packing adventure. I'd done lots of bike tours up until that point on pavement. Even the ride home from Honduras was not that hard. It was on pavement. Then I did the Baja Divide in 2017, right when it was inaugurated. And I was like, this is gonna be so much fun. I love mountain biking. I grew up in Boulder, just loving mountain biking. This is gonna be just like mountain biking, which I love. And what I learned very quickly is that it's not at all like mountain biking. It is like dirt roads with tons of silty deep sand because the Baja 1000 car race goes through and rips it all up. So it's really hard to pedal. It's super hot. And if it's not sandy, it's washboardy where you're just like going like this the whole time and it just hurts and it's horrible. Um, and so that was a big wake up call for me. And that, thank you for the segue, was my very first failure on a bike trip ever. Every other bike trip I had done up until that point, I had gone from A to B. I had accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. The Baja Divide was the very first time it just beat the crap out of me for two weeks. And I wanted to do the full 1,700 miles in one go. And it got to the point where I was like, after 900 miles, I was like, I'm miserable. I also got saddle sores because of the um, washboard. And it was tough. And I remember thinking, wow, I'm, I'm going to go home. How do I feel about this? This is weird. Like, I'm not going to get to the end. Like, I have a plane ticket out of Cabo San Lucas. That's, I, I'm far away from that. <laughs> How am I going to get there? And I, what I did was I hitchhiked on a bus back up to um, the border into um, San Diego. So that was my very first taste of something not going my way. And in the moment when you quit something, you feel relief because you're like, oh God, like I don't have to wake up tomorrow and do this, which feels great. But very quickly after that comes the feelings of regret. And that is what's tough. And I think we can all relate to those feelings where it's like, man, if I just pulled, pushed a little bit harder, if I had just toughed it out, I could have done it. You get home and you start spiraling through your head all the what shoulda, couldas. And uh, it's quite the mind game. It really is. And what I've learned through these things is that there's a lot more to life than perfection. There's a lot more to life than always accomplishing what you set your mind to. There are so many lessons to be learned along the way, even if you don't get to the end. And for me, a big one of those is humility, you know, and patience and being kind to myself. Because I can be very, very hard on myself when things don't go my way. And I beat myself up. And that's with relationships with women in the past as well. I'll blame everything on myself and I'll just go into a deep, dark hole. And that's a dangerous place to be. That's where your mind starts really playing tricks on you. And so when that happens, that's when I really lean on community. And especially my mom. I have called her so many times sobbing after a breakup. <laughs> Do we have any moms in the audience who have had sons that have breakups like this and like call my mom? What am I going to do? Well, with you, the whole world knows me. Well, yeah, that's true. You're all my moms. <laughs> <laughs> no, just the three people the, the you son that calls count. Yes, absolutely. Fine, I'll raise my hand. All right, here we go. Um, okay, do we have a question back here? I was wondering, um, this, this feels very relevant to me as someone who just lost their job in media, studied for a job, and now I'm kind of considering going it my own. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about being a business owner and like the instability of it and yeah. thinking down the, down the road, what, five, ten, yeah. and if you go that far or, or not. Yeah, first of all, I'm sorry. I know where you're at and it's scary, but there's hope and it will get better. And that's always the big thing. It will always get better. It might get a little bit worse for a while, but it will always get better as long as you stay hopeful and you stay relentless to what you want to accomplish. And so that's always been the benefit of what I've done. So, you know, I try to be a TV host over and over and over, heartbreak, 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 but I've just been relentless with it. And <clears throat> the way I navigate through these tough situations is learning and trying to get better and better and better to the point where it's like, they have to hire me because I've, I'm so good. Like, I've gotten so good. I've, I've learned so much. Like, they'd be crazy to pass up on me. 
you know? And so that goes with all of us. Like if you, like, a, you know, an elite athlete, like football player or something, if you're trying to make a team over and over and over and you're working super hard in the off season, then you're finally going to get to that point, you know? And if you don't, then you might pivot somewhere else, but you will have success at some point. Like it will come and I know it's hard. So me as a YouTube business owner, it's always a roller coaster, even to this day. I can have really good months or good years. I can have bad months and bad years. Right now, this year has been a very bad year on YouTube. My, my views are way, way down. My engagement's way down. And I don't really know why. That's the mystery of YouTube. What? I've been on tour. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah, you're all here, which all that, this is all that matters. I don't care about the rest of people who watch my videos. You're the ones that came here. But uh, it is scary, you know? I'm like, okay, now I'm 45 years old, I just bought a house, I have a mortgage, and YouTube is really hurting. What can I do differently to make sure that I continue to have sex? Sex? <laughs> Whoa, that was good! That's the answer! That's the answer. So, the reason why you're all here tonight is to announce that I am, I have an OnlyFans page. <laughs> success. Success was the word I meant to say. <laughs> yes. What can I do? How do I evolve? How do I get better? You know, and so I, I learn. I, I look at analytics. I learn about what the audience might want. I learn about how I, maybe I can be a more engaging storyteller. I learn about how I can use cameras in a different way to make my videos look a little bit better maybe, which is fun for me because I love learning. We all love the process of learning every day. I think, you know, humans, we are who we are because every day is a new adventure and we're like, okay, here we go. Like, let's see what happens. And a part of that is like learning and learning how to commu communicate with people and learning how to use editing software better or whatever it is. Um, so it's been an up and down journey with YouTube. You know, my channel is fairly big now. It's exciting. It's bigger than I ever thought it would be. I, you know, make more consistent money than I ever did because of Patreon. Thank you, patrons. Whoop, whoop. You know, and YouTube ads, and um, I get royalties off the sales of the, the priority ADX bike. So there's a lot of different things that make me money. And it's exciting to be able to be there because when I worked in the TV world, I might get a job and it would last for a couple weeks and I'd make a few thousand dollars or whatever, but then I'd be back to ground zero and like searching for the next job as a freelancer, which is a scary place to be. Now I have consistent money. Even though it's, you know, this year hasn't been great, it's still consistent. Um, so I don't know if that really answered your question, but it really is staying true to what you want to do in life and to your dreams and passions and sticking with it so fervently that nothing else is going to pull you away. You know, when, early on in my career, when things were tough and I wasn't making any money and I lived in mom's basement, she was always like, why don't you just go get a job at the local newspaper or at the TV station in Denver? You have a broadcast news degree from the University of Colorado. Like, you can get a regular job with health insurance because she wanted me to be safe, right? She wanted me to have a safe job, safe money. And I was like, that's just not it. Like, that's not what I want to do. I want to create long form documentary type stuff that impacts people in a positive way. And I always looked at local news as kind of depressing, which it, which it is. <laughs> You know, I'm not ragging on it. I think there's, there's importance in local news for sure. But it's not what I wanted to do. And I just stuck with it and stuck with it and stuck with it. And here I am at age 45, still doing it and still figuring it out. Like, it's not a done deal. It's not like I'm, I'm safe and I'm good until retirement and, you know, every year I'm going to get a raise. That's not how it works. You know, but because of it, you have freedom that other nine to five jobs don't have. There are, there are pluses and minuses to these types of careers and there's consequences as well. So uh, you just have to balance like what's most important to you. Yeah. Uh, what's your work life balance? I mean, so much of your life is, is making videos, right? Yeah. So what, how do you turn that off? Yeah. Good question. Work life balance. What is my work life balance and how do I turn it off and just live life? I've gotten a lot of questions over the years saying, do you ever just go do a bike trip and not film it? 
And the answer is no, because if I'm gonna go, on, go through the effort of going on a bike trip, I want to create content. This is like a business trip for me. Whenever I go somewhere and do one of these adventures, I always joke to my mom, like, you're going on a business trip, because it really is, it's my job now. But for sure there are moments where I'm like, this would be, it'd be so nice just to go ride my bike and not be thinking about, oh, this would be a great drone shot. I should stop and get out the drone, or I should put my camera on the tripod and run back and get on my bike and ride in front of the tripod and pack it up again and do that over and over and over all day long. Like it's definitely tiring, it's definitely work. I love it, but it's definitely work. So my work-life balance is pretty good. When I'm on an adventure, it's all hands on deck. You know, I'm physically doing something hard, but I'm also, making sure that I'm documenting all the important moments. There's a saying, if you didn't record it, it didn't happen. And so even like after 80 miles of a hard day and it's raining and the last thing I wanna do is hit that record button and talk to the camera, I do it because those are the moments also that are the most vulnerable and real when I'm talking to the camera and talking like, oh boy, this is a tough one. Like, I don't know how I'm gonna get through this, pushing my bike through snow or mud or whatever it is. And for the audience on the other side, when you're seeing that, you're seeing like raw Ryan for sure. Not just like the ole ole going through tunnels, woo, you know? And I think that's what make, makes my videos a little bit more human is when you show the hard times, right? You show like the emotions that you go through. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Any other, here we go. How do I travel with my bike, specifically like packing it up in a box when I'm traveling on an airplane somewhere far away? This is my least favorite part of adventures, for sure. But it's doable. I usually go to a local bike shop. They always have boxes, or they usually have boxes. You ask them to give you a box. They should always give you one, you know, because they're just going to toss them in the recycling. And you break your bike down, and you put it in the box, and you hope that Everything's gonna be there when you open it up, when you get on the other end. It's not, it hasn't always happened that way with me. But uh, <laughs> I made a video about this if you wanna watch like how to box up a bike. Um, and I always put my camping equipment in the box as well so it's kinda of padded up a little bit. And then, you know, for me, a guy with no car, I have to figure out a way to get me and my bike box to the bus and then put it under the bus and take the bus to the airport and drag it to the airport and then finally check it in and on the other end, you know, I, hopefully the bike comes all in one piece and then I find a taxi that's big enough to put the bike box in and go to like my hotel or Airbnb. And um, I never, it's very rare that I do a loop and finish where I started. So I just throw the box away or recycle it. And then when I get to the end of wherever I'm going, then it's a game of, okay, time to go to the bike shops and see if I can find a box that's big enough. My bikes are big, you know, wide tires. A lot of times I'll go to a bike shop and they're like, we only have road bike boxes. And you're like, ah, oh, man, it's so hard to get a mountain bike into a road bike box. It's, my, <laughs> it's not very fun. But you cram it all in there and it's always worked out. Again, it's like problem solving. Just like with adventures and anything through life, like it's kind of a fun game. It's like, okay, I just did this hard adventure and my flight is in eight hours and I need to get this bike into a box. There was one time I did the whole West Coast from Vancouver to Cabo San Lucas, and I got to the, the city. There's not a huge bike culture in Cabo San Lucas. It's kind of party culture. They don't sell a lot of bikes to tourists, and the bike shops that were there were selling like BMX style bikes to like kids, and I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Like, I have no idea how I'm gonna get my bike on this airplane. And I was walking around, and I went next to, where I rode, walked next to an electronics store, and there were big screen TVs in the window. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna ask and see if they have a big screen TV box. And sure enough, they did. And so there's always a way. I've also heard people, you know, if you get pieces of cardboard at least, and you kind of tape it all up in a ramshackle way, that can work as well. So, yeah, look up, there's, there's videos, not just mine, but other people who have given tutorials about how to travel with a bike. Yeah, and I've also traveled with a bike and gotten to the other end and TSA has gone through it and oh, taken out very important things that I need. And so make sure when you do this to have the most important things that cannot be lost like on your carry-on. And in this specific example, I got to San Diego once and they had gone through my entire frame bag and taken everything out of it and did not put it back in. I don't know why they didn't put it back in but they didn't, I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt and maybe think they forgot. I don't think they were stealing random stuff, but they had my front axle that is very specific 
to the Ren Fork, and no bike shops in San Diego have the Ren Fork, and I fixed it by problem solving. Sat there, kind of frustrated for a second, and said, oh, maybe I'll put something on social media and ask if anybody in the San Diego area has a Priority 600X. And if you do, would you lend me your front axle? <laughs> And sure enough, within an hour, some, some young guy said, I have a priority, you can totally have my axle, and I can come drop it off in half an hour. And so it's, it's amazing how the world works. Like you, Sometimes you think you are so screwed, and then an angel comes, a trail angel, in some way, shape, or form, and saves the day. Yeah. Yes? Will you ever do like a collab with some like anti-car, pro-bike, urbanist YouTubers? <laughs> Yeah, I would love to do that. You know, I would love to do a c collab with Not Just Bikes or Shifter. Do you know Shifter? Um, all those people are making uh, content. I think it's so important what they're doing for the world because we live at a time now where climate change is a thing. We all know this. We've learned this. When I say this on YouTube, you wouldn't believe how much hate I get about just acknowledging that climate change is actually a thing. Um, and we need to like think of ways to be kinder to the environment. And I think riding a, a bike is a huge thing. And so these channels on YouTube are really showing people what cities around the world are doing to create safe bike, bike infrastructure so that people feel safe riding their bikes to work and all these different things so we can not be so reliant on fossil fuel and cars. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Here we go. I just want to ask you a question. I noticed, uh, you know, I love your channel, but it's it's really a lot of gravel. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, you know, your roots were, you know, you did a lot of road tours. Yeah. And, you know, so it's it's tough to ride a hundred pound bike down a gravel trail. Yeah. So, I, I kind of missed that. And I, do you have any desire to do any of that kind of stuff? More like road tours? Yeah, but like like local, like the, the woman was just asking about local, like mm -hmm. you know, you know, like local. There's a lot of really good trails out there. Yeah. That, um, I know there's a lot of people covered them. You know, yeah, you know, I would love to do more local gravel type stuff yeah. for sure. I've purposely stayed away from pavement now because I don't really trust drivers all that much anymore. <laughs> because of cell phones and distracted driving, it's become a huge issue. Urban and pedestrian fatalities have skyrocketed because of this. And I don't feel safe on a lot of paved roads. I really don't. And so for the first part of my bike touring life, everything was on pavement. But now I really try to do gravel roads and dirt roads because they're safer, you know? Um, but I also realize that paved road riding is easier and more people might be attracted to that because, you know, gravel and dirt and trails, it's hard. It's very hard. And then. Early Sunday mornings, yeah. The best time to ride. Yeah, that's true. Early Sunday morning, that's true. Absolutely. There yep. could still be a drunk driver. There still could be drunk drivers, that is true. And so we do our best to stay safe, you know. I try to be visible. I try to have lights on the, the back of my bike and all that. But you never know. You never know. Here we go. We all love Raw Ryan. Yeah, Raw Ryan. Well, like Raw Raw Ryan or Raw Ryan? In all sense. Okay. <laughs> raw Raw, but Raw wearing your heart on your sleeve, Ryan. Yeah. Um, most people who do content creation yeah. do perception management. Mm. They're only selecting the certain things to share with their audience. Yeah. And I think we all like it because we think, yeah. unless you're really good at this, <laughs> that this is the real Ryan. Yeah. Um, there have to be some downsides. Yes. We've seen you through ups and downs of bicycle trips, but also personal relationships. Yeah. Have you changed a little now in how you deal with how much you share? That's a great question. Um, I, as far as bike trips goes and the hard times that I go through on those trips, I will always be real and upfront and put my heart on my sleeve. That will always stay the same. Um, I think it's really important to share those moments because it is scary to head out on an adventure and to not know what's gonna happen to, or to know that it's going to be very, very hard. And I think it's important to tell those stories because it's not all, you're not always on top of the mountain. You're not always accomplish, accomplishing the big, the big things. And uh, 
Um, you're not always 10 out of 10. And I think it's very important to, to show that to the world because we live in a very curated world, right? Where social media and YouTube videos and it's like, it's like the best and the best and the best and the best. And that's fun sometimes to watch, but it's not very real. It's not the human experience. We all go through ups and downs. And so I will always show the, the good times and the bad times for sure. Um, and I've, that's always that's the way my channel's been since day one. And people have criticized me so many times. Like, why would you ever show yourself breaking down on camera? Like, why would you show that, that weakness? And we live in a world where at least the perception of, of men is supposed to be that we're always supposed to be tough and strong and we never show weakness. And in this case, like tears or, or having a bad moment. And I think that's very dangerous. And I think finally the perception is changing because I think one of the most masculine things we can do is to show our emotions and to, to be real. And when times are tough or when we're sad or when we're scared, to portray those moments in a very honest and genuine way. And so I'll, I will always do that. As far as introducing girlfriends to YouTube, <laughs> You know, people have asked me recently if I'm going to like introduce this new woman on YouTube. And I'm sure I will someday because it's a very important part of my life, you know, and I share my life with you. And that's like all aspects of my life. My mom's on my channel, Dana, friends and family, like everybody who I love, I want you to meet. You know, I want you to meet these people who are so wonderful to me. And so I imagine, you know, I will introduce her at some point, but uh, the fallout from breakups that I've had on YouTube is mostly really good because everybody is very kind and loving, but man, people can be mean, really mean. Like this January when I finally talked about the breakup with Amelia in Baja, most people were very cool, but there were some cruel comments in there essentially saying like, this Van Duzer guy can't be real. There must be something wrong with him. How could he be, keep on having these women and, and failing at these relationships? I don't think that he's really the way he is. You know, they're saying mean stuff. And it's like, I don't want to see those, but I also definitely don't want my girlfriends or ex-girlfriends seeing these comments because it's just, it's mean. We could live in a very mean world. I made a whole video once on mean comments on YouTube and how I usually <laughs> deal with them. And I can like shrug off most of this stuff, I get it. It says a lot more about them than it does about me. And you know, I've been criticized, all, my life has been on YouTube for a long time now. So I do wanna be mindful of the other party in this relationship, it's not just me, you know? And so, I don't know if that really answered your question. Um, but you'll, you'll meet this special person at some point because I want to go on adventures with her. You know, I want to show her what I love. I love bikepacking. It's a huge part of my life. And I want her to go with me. And whenever I go on an adventure, I film it. Right? <laughs> so, yeah. But what's her bike flavor? <laughs> what's her bike flavor? So she also does not have a car. She rides her bike everywhere. She has a cute little basket in front for her cute little dog. <coughs> It's very, very sweet. And uh, she just has a very simple commuter bike that she bought online for like 300 bucks and it's a total piece of junk and I, I want to get her on a priority. But she's like very emotionally connected to this bike and so I'm just letting her have this sweet little bike and someday we'll get her on probably, you know, one of the adventure bikes so we can go, go camping together. Yeah. <laughs> Before you all leave, I just want to say thank you for coming tonight. It means the world to me to be able to see you in real life and that you watch my videos. I love you all.